morning. Happy Sabbath. Feliz Sabado. Bon Sabbath. Shabbat Fedachit. Did I miss anybody? Welcome, everyone. Um, I want to ask you how many of you, if you were to think back to this time one year ago, how many of you would have thought we have gone through what we have this year? This is just in our in our recent histories without precedent. And however bad we think this is, you know, we're told a time of trouble is coming, such as the world has not seen since there was a nation. And uh, you know, so we need to brace ourselves for, for what's coming. So what I have uh, prepared today is, is basically a good old fashioned Bible study, uh, a word study in a manner of speaking. Um, it's going to be a lot of text involved and um, so it'll be kind of rapid fire and a lot of it's going to go in one ear and out the other. But I prepared um, some study guides so after the service if any of you are interested in following up and kind of reviewing uh, what we share up here today, uh, that, that'll be available for you. Uh, so before we begin, uh, let's pause again just for a moment. Heavenly Father, especially ask for your grace just now. I pray that your spirit and your angels will be present with each one of us. Lord, I pray that the words we hear not be the words of a faulty, sinful speaker, but may it be the words of your still, small voice speaking to our hearts. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I invite you to open up your Bibles, uh, at least for to begin with, um, to the book of Ezekiel, to chapter 28. Now, chapter 28 of Ezekiel starts out as a judgment, as a prophecy against the king of Tyre. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But um, if you have your Bible open to Ezekiel 28, then we're going to... Um, we're going to begin at verse 12. And this is what the Bible says. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you seal up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You have been in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and then gold as well. The workmanship of your tabrets and of your pipes was prepared in you in the day that you were created. You are the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. You know, chapter 28, again, uh, started out as a judgment against the king of Tyre. Tyre was a coastal kingdom along the Mediterranean rim. And the king of Tyre, that, that God is speaking of here, was a contemporary of, of Ezekiel and, and of Daniel. Uh, 
He was a proud, arrogant ruler. He uh, was boastful of his superiority. And so his downfall was predicted in these opening verses. But then, if you noticed, as we got to verse 12, all of a sudden, the passage that we just read has kind of morphed into a a more cosmic application. It um, talks about the downfall of a high-ranking being in heavenly places. He's not mentioned by name here. You can read in Isaiah chapter 14 and verses 12 to 14 the name of, the, of this being. But the thing is that God is, in essence, he's speaking to this person, this angelic being personally. He is talked about his exalted past, his position in in the kingdom, and then goes on in this lamentation that uh, several verses later on, God makes clear what the demise of this being is going to be. Um, And so this chapter in Ezekiel, along with the chapter in Isaiah 14, Kind of, they give us a window into what Revelation chapter 12 calls in the Greek a polemos, a war, a cosmic battle that's a battle of ideologies. And it's between Christ and his adversary. So this lamentation in Ezekiel makes clear that there is to be an end to this conflict and coming at some point in the future. But for now, for our study this morning, we want to focus on what the source of this rebellion is and what, what effect does it have on you and me in our in our spiritual life, in our walk with Jesus. So we find a clue right in verse 15. If you go back and revisit that verse, God said of his adversary, you were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. So perfect right up to that moment. So what is iniquity? What is the stuff that it's made of? Why is it that this verse tells us it has nothing to do with what God had created him to be and that he was perfect at one time? Wouldn't it be worth our while to to strive to understand what this iniquity is is all about? Well, there are three words you'll find in Scripture that define our lost estate, our lost condition, our lost standing before God. And uh, they're like legs of a stool, if you will. You know, a stool can't stand on two legs alone. It needs at least three. And... And so these words have, each have distinct meaning and distinct application in describing what our lost condition is. And uh, interestingly, the Lord himself, God himself, told us about those three words there at Mount Sinai. Now, just for the sake of time, I'm going to rattle through scriptures Uh, Like I said, there will be a a study guide available, but uh, I want to bring your mind to recall uh, in the book of Exodus in chapter 33, there there had been a rebellion, the golden calf thing, and and Moses had to go straighten that out, and, and a number of people perished as a result. 
And after Moses patched things up, so to speak, with the Lord, he, he asked him, Lord, show me your glory. And, and God told him, I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. So you move on to chapter 34, and you, you find the next day at Moses there on the mountain, uh, beginning at verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord, in verse 6, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. And then verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. That was God speaking there. Did you see them? Did you hear them, perhaps? Did the, the three words I was talking about? It's right there in verse 7. God said that he forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. And as I mentioned, they all have a distinct meaning and an application to um, describe how we live and move and have our being perhaps in opposition to God. So uh, the word iniquity in the Hebrew is called awan, A-W-O-N. And in the Greek in the New Testament, uh, it's translated from anomia. And both of these words suggest a, a, a state of lawlessness, um, a pathway of life that runs contrary to what God's design is for us. But did you also notice that iniquity is passed on from the father to the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. What's up with that? Why, why does that happen and, and why should we strive to understand what that's about? So this begs the question, why is it that iniquity is passed on from one generation to the next? Is this some sort of an arbitrary rule that God made up, uh, uh, a law that God imposed to, to punish the guilty? Or, well, actually there are many Christians that would believe that sort of thing. Um, and, and in essence, they're saying, well, I'm guilty because of what Adam did back there in the garden. Um, some Christians would call that original sin. Well, is there an alternative viewpoint? Is it that um, iniquity, this, this wrong pathway, is subject to the laws of heredity and genetics? where certain characteristics are passed down from one generation to the next and the next. I believe the adversary would have us believe that this was some sort of arbitrary rule that God made up, and he's just, just waiting to, to punish us for that. Um, so the question is, how is it that we are to understand and regard what God, God's laws are like. Um, listen to these words that are found in a book called Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing on page 109. The will of God is expressed in the precepts of his holy law, 
And the principles of this law are the principles of heaven. The angels of heaven attained unto no higher knowledge than to know the will of God and to do his will is the highest service that can engage their powers. But in heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of. In their ministry, the angels are not as servants, but as sons. There is perfect unity between them and their creator. Obedience to them is no drudgery. Love for God makes their service a joy. So in every soul wherein Christ, the hope of glory, dwells, his words are re-echoed. I delight to do your will, O my God. Yes, your law is within my heart. Did you catch that? The thought that there even was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of? How could that be? Wasn't there some published code of law telling them what to do, what not to do? how to behave? Is this how we are to understand God's laws and how they function? Well, there's two different definitions of what law is. One definition would state that it's the, a collection of statutes that governments and governments of the world have employed ever since there was a nation. Uh, these laws are made up as they go along. They answer current and perceived needs, and they carry with them sanctions that are deemed to be appropriate for their violation. Just uh, for example, go park your car in a no parking zone. When, when you come back out, you may have to find that you have to retrieve your vehicle at the impound yard. And then after you've paid a significant fine, you can have your car back, that, that sort of thing. Well, there's another definition of law. You find that mostly in, in the uh, field of science where law is a, a collection of the descriptions of observable phenomena in the universe. Isaac Newton wrote a lot of these laws describing things that he observed, like laws of gravity, of thermodynamics, and so on. So, all these laws do is put into human language an understanding of the nature of how God uh, made things to work and how reality actually operates. Now the fact that God's, the laws of God's government were something almost unthought of among highly intelligent beings it says to me that when God created space and time and matter and light and life, he didn't bother to codify all these parameters, all their protocols that define their respective realities. God created space to accommodate billions of galaxies, each of them with billions of stars, each to occupy their respective space without colliding into one another. Was that arbitrary or is that just the way God did it? He created uh, matter 
that could be converted into energy. He created light with a whole spectrum of colors of all the things that we see around us. He created life to flow from himself in an unending stream to all living things. And within this umbrella law of life, we find some sub-laws, such as the laws of health, which why I'm one of the few in violation here. I'm distanced far enough, I hope. Um, he created laws of exertion and rest. Use it or lose it, right? And when you exert yourself, then the body needs a period of recovery. He, um, he wrote laws of worship that are defined in the Bible by Paul. He said, by beholding, we become changed into the same image. Whatever it is you're beholding, you become like that. Um, he designed laws of liberty. Read in Acts chapter 17 that um, Paul, speaking of Jesus, said that he, um, how did he put it? It's in Christ that we live and move and have our being. And so my being has a, has a sphere, a realm, and so do all of yours. And if we respect the law of liberty, we respect the liberty of the other. Okay? And he even uh, has laws of morality. Have you heard of them? You know, we, we tend to focus on that a lot. What's right, what's wrong. Um, and so God designed all of these things to function in such a way for our benefit and for our blessing and for all creation to, to share in this. And so angelic beings just simply lived and moved and had their being by what came naturally to them. It's what God had purposed for them. So then you get back to verse 15 in Ezekiel 28, and you see that this covering cherub was perfect in his ways until iniquity was found in him. So there was something else, something the adversary wanted to appropriate for himself out of a covetous desire some other place, some other role in the kingdom from what God had, had given him, which I think we understand was the highest possible of all created things. So um, if you look at the first part of verse 17, it says there, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. And so, in other words, we could say that the essence of iniquity is self-interest. Self-interest in the adversary first manifested as a form of self-indulgence in seeking a place in the kingdom other than the one that God had prepared for him. But then it progressed into self-preservation. Uh, the adversary not only defended his course of action, but then he went on to, um, to fight to achieve it. 
So I guess you could say that if iniquity was a coin, one side of it would be self-indulgence, and, and the other side of it would be self-preservation. So the question for us here is, where is it we fit into this picture? Well, Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2 says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. So whatever form iniquity takes, it causes a separation from God, a separation from the source of life. And what would that make it? It would make it a a terminal illness, wouldn't it? God's word tells us we've inherited some of this stuff, some of this iniquity from our ancestors. Then we go about the course of our life and we, um, we maybe acquire some more stuff, some more iniquity. And then the tragic thing is us fathers pass that along to the children and the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. It's an unhealthy cycle that has led humankind on a downward path, and that cycle must be broken. So listen to these words now from a book called Our High Calling, found on page 347. The work of apostasy begins in some secret rebellion of the heart against the requirements of God's law. Unholy desires, unlawful ambitions are cherished and indulged, and unbelief and darkness separate the soul from God. If we do not overcome these evils, they will overcome us. So in, the, in this passage, iniquity, iniquities were called unholy desires or unlawful ambitions. There's other words familiar to many of us um, like sinful propensities or s- sinful inclinations. So we have this condition about us and Now, this is what Isaiah, the gospel prophet, told us about this. Uh, Chapter 53 in verse 1, Isaiah poses the question, Who's believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And skip down to verse 5. And there Isaiah says, of speaking of Jesus, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I, um, I blew that verse, let me try that again. He was wounded for our transgressions He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I cannot overstate how profound those words are. It's in our nature by virtue of our heritage to go astray, to go our own way. And God saw our predicament 
And he chose to leave heaven to clothe himself with our humanity to become a whole new being, all God, all man, housed in the same flesh. And he did this so that he could take upon himself all our stuff, all of all our sins, all of our iniquity, all of our guilt of all humankind. And then he took that with him to the cross. How is it that Jesus could do that? Well, the Bible tells us, you'll see this in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12, that Jesus did no sin. And if that's not enough, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, says that Jesus knew no sin, and yet he became sin for us. So Jesus did no sin, knew no sin, but became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. How would it be possible for Jesus to accomplish this? Is there something that sets him apart from you and me? Well, I believe it is, and I believe it goes to this, this law of iniquity, the tied to the, the law of heredity and, and of, of genetics, and um, is just the inevitable consequence that's passed on from generation to generation to generation. And so this begs the question, if iniquity is passed on from the father to the children, what iniquity would you suppose that a holy God passed on to his holy son? It's a rhetorical question, friends. It's, it's a preposterous question. The point of it is, the Lamb of God, free of defect, faultless before the throne, took upon himself the iniquity of us all. He could do that because he had none of his own. Deuteronomy chapter 32 in verse 4 says this, he, Jesus, is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. And if we were to take the time to look a little closer in the cosmic battle between Christ and his adversary that came to this earth, the battlefield here, we would find that self-interest was utterly foreign to his nature. As Craig pointed out in Sabbath school, equality with God was, was his to claim. But he laid that aside to, to come to our rescue. And, and so self-interest was utterly, entirely foreign to his nature. And we find in his battle with the adversary, perhaps two of the greatest tests of faith that we'll, we'll spend all of eternity trying to fathom. Um, the first one was there in the wilderness after, after fasting for 40 days. In essence, he's saying to his father, Father, I'm not going to eat again until you provide food for me. I need to redeem this failure of Adam and Eve over appetite. Um, so the adversary came to him and said, uh, well, if you're the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? 
I'm sure you're hungry. I'm sure you're starving. I'm sure you're pretty close to dying. So he tempted Jesus to indulge that power. Then at the end of his ministry, he's there in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is Aramaic for olive press. And in a process that, that, that science absolutely cannot describe, all of the guilt of all the sins of mankind traveled through time and space and converged on the person of Jesus. And the adversary pressed his argument, you know, you're so filthy, dirty now, you'll never be clean, you'll never be accepted by, by God. And he tempted him, you know, come down off that cross. He would have acted in his self-defense had he done that. And had he done that, the whole plan would have been for nothing. He could have gone home to heaven. You and I would be lost. But the point is that in every instance, in every encounter with the adversary, in every temptation, whether it be in thought or word or deed, Jesus did not yield. And his victory over all the, the classes of failures that mankind has invented over the course of history, he's redeemed them all, all of our defeats, all of our failures. So we read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, but unto the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Now, I, earlier, I mentioned this passage in Isaiah 53. If you were to go down to verse 11, you'll see that uh, Isaiah said of Jesus, he shall see the travail of his soul, shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Perhaps no one who's ever articulated the battle with self has, has done a better job than the Apostle Paul. I'd invite you sometime when you have the time and the motivation, revisit chapters 7 and 8 of the book of Romans. I'm cutting this down for the sake of time to begin in chapter 7 at verse 18. For I know that in me, he says, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will or to choose is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not the condition of the flesh, of the carnal mind. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. That conflict between our natural appetites and the cognizant knowledge of what God's will is. So he says in verse 21, I, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see 
another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He's describing his observation of a phenomena in his own heart and mind, is he not? Then verse 24, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Then he goes on into chapter 8. These are precious words for all of us. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. He goes on to explain there that um, self-interest is conquered in our lives by an abiding relationship with Jesus, in Jesus, in obedience to God's law of worship, which states that by beholding we become changed. So Paul's armed with this knowledge. Now he goes to his young companion, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. He says, nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. We want him to know us, don't we? And then he says, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So how are we going to do that? What kind of practical instruction does God have for us? Well, you will find words of the wise man, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 6, which says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So, mercy and truth will purge iniquity. Now, where do you, where do you go to get mercy and truth? Well, of course, you go to God, but where do you find it? How was it that God described himself to Moses? said he's merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. This is our God that wants us to come to him and, and, and come home. These things are depicted in the sanctuary, if you think about it, in the most holy place, the second apartment, where the Ark of the Covenant is. That Ark was a, a chest that holding something, right? And is covered with a covering of pure gold with two angels depicted guarding it. What, what's that cover called? It's called the mercy seat. God's throne is a mercy seat. And what do you find underneath there in that ark? You find the law, don't you? Um, you find truth there. There are three definitions in the Bible that tell us what truth is. John chapter 14 and verse 6 Jesus 
answered his doubting disciple Thomas. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So he's forged for us a new way to live. Definition number two is in his prayer to his father in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John, in verse 17. And there he's pleading with his father, sanctify them, make them holy by your truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus is truth, the word is truth. One more, Psalm 119, verse 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is the truth. So Jesus is truth, his word is truth, his law is truth. And you find all of that in the most holy place. You find it in a personal relationship with Jesus. So, what's the bottom line here? What do we need to do? Well, take time every day to be with the Lord. You'll hear Pastor Schnell week after week after week. Spend time in this book. Make it your first work. Spend time in prayer. If you start out your day that way, the day will go better. I know all about days that don't go so good. we find that God, not just Jesus, Son of God, not just Holy Spirit, but Father God himself is abundant in mercy and truth. And we find it in this book. Now this book is unlike every other book that has ever been written or will be written. There's life in this book. It was breathed by God to inspire the people that wrote it. But it also, when we spend time in that in this book, God will bring it to life to enlighten our hearts and minds as well. And the the proof of this, the truth of it, is found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So once again, this law of worship tells us that by beholding, we're changed into uh, the image of what we're beholding. So behold the Lord in prayer. Behold him in his word, and it will change your life. You know that, and I know that, but We're not a finished work yet, are we? So, I see where we are for time. I'm going to um, truncate this a little bit. Um, But you may want to look at Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, and I'll just mention there that the Lord said of Joshua the high priest, take the filthy garments from him. And then he said to Joshua, behold, I've caused your iniquity to pass from you. So 
How about a moment of present truth? The words of Jesus in Matthew 24, his prophecies of what would be coming on the world. This is verses 12 to 14. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Am I the only one that sees iniquity abounding in the world? I hardly think so. But God does not want it to abound in our hearts. He says, he that endures to the end, that does not let the agape love of God grow cold in our hearts, is the one that will be saved. I've got one more statement to share with you uh, from the book called Desire of Ages, page 671. In describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. He rejoiced because of the abundant help he has provided for his church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent and without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It is by the spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon the church. I'll close with words of David, first from Psalm 119, verse 133. His plea to God was, order my steps in your word, let not any iniquity have dominion over me. And then our scripture reading this morning from Psalm 139, verses 23, 24. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Let's pray. Holy Father, you saw our predicament from the foundation of the world. You saw that we're helpless, powerless to overcome the things that drive us in this world of sin. You've made provision by your grace in, in clothing yourself with humanity, manifesting yourself in flesh. You are merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. 
please draw near to each of us and please cleanse us of our leprosy of sin. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.